Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Well, there's a psalm. It's in one of these books. Um, I don't know that if it's in ours, but one of the lines goes that, that God has not promised a flower-strewn pathway all our lives through. How true that is. We, we certainly have... Uh, our ups and our downs, we cannot walk on the mountaintop all the time. As much as we would like to be able to just to skip from one mountaintop to the next, uh, we can't do that. And we can't just sit still. Uh, either we're pressing forward or we're back sliding. So in that journey, uh, we have to go through some valleys. Uh, the promise is that He'll be with us. As we read in the 23rd Psalm, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no, fear no evil, for Thou art with me. So we have, we have times of uh, great rejoicing, confidence and assurance uh, to know that we belong to the Lord and that He has purchased us and there are times when we don't feel that, when we have times of uh, discouragement, despondency, maybe even depression that we sometimes go through. Uh, yet the Lord suffers these things for reasons that we probably don't understand. But He does tell us that I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared of the glory which shall be revealed in us. And James says, what is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for an instant and then is gone. Lots of things that take place in this life are vanity. And Solomon spends quite a bit of time in the book of Ecclesiastes speaking about the vanity of life. But one thing is for certain, and maybe I'm speaking to myself this morning, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And vanity simply means it's empty. It's nothing. It's of no use. Uh, there's a lot of things in the world that are like that, that are, that are vain and empty and of no use. But our labor in the Lord is not in vain. God takes notice. He's, he says He's faithful to remember your love and, and the ministry to the saints that you have. And so we should be uh, ever mindful that regardless of what we perceive, whether we're on the mountain, whether we're in the plains, or whether we're in the valley, it's not really our perception uh, that is the reality. God never changes. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Sometimes because our perception of reality can be skewed uh, by things that take place in our lives. But the good news is that our God is immutable. He's unchangeable. And His promises are yea and amen. And He never changes. He never changes His promises. So we can be encouraged to know that even though we may not be able to perceive the blessings or the nearness or the, even have the confidence or assurance of God, the Lord doesn't change. He promised I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Yet it's necessary uh, for the tempering uh, of our 
lives that sometimes our faith is tried in the fire. He said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. He didn't say that might try you or could try you, but which is to try you. So our faith is tried in the fire and through the troubles and the trials of this life, God is consuming the dross from our lives. It's like when any fine metal is purified, it's put in the fire. And every, every metal has a different melting point. Uh, take gold, for instance. When gold is heated, you see that all the impurities come to the top. All the impurities rise. The impurities are of a lighter weight than the gold itself. And the impurities can be skimmed off. And this is how sometimes it works in our life. As a matter of fact, the Lord says in one place, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. So the afflictions that we, uh, that we suffer, David says, it is good that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy laws and thy statutes. So, every one of us are going to have trials and tribulations and sufferings and afflictions and, tribu- and uh, persecutions. Uh, every one of us are. And it's for our, our own good. Even though we may not understand it. Uh, and even though many times it's not pleasant. I, I, I give you an example of the fact that a rose bush even when a rose bush is not blooming, it's still a rose bush. And it has thorns. And a lot of times with not just a rose bush, but with other plants, they have to be pruned. And the reason that they're pruned is so that they can bring forth more fruit. I suspect that the pruning process also is not very pleasant. But As far as a rose goes, in my experience, I knew that when I would have a rose that was dying, I could cut it off. And there would be two that would come back in its place. So, the Lord knows what He's doing. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And we, we abide in Him. And sometimes it's necessary that a pruning takes place. Um... I say all that to, I guess maybe I'm just preaching to myself right now. And that happens at times. Uh, I, need, I need a message from the Lord just as well as anybody else does. Uh, and and it's, it's amazing how, how gracious that God is and that He uh, always hears our prayers and answers our needs. I was speaking last week about the rest finding rest. Um, Betty and I went and uh, did some shopping yesterday and we came back home and I sat down and, and I was trying to get some videos done and she was up busy uh, rearranging the pantry and the refrigerator and uh, did everything short of pulling the refrigerator out and dusting behind it and when she got done she said she was tired. She needed to rest. And I can understand that. I I'm, I'm don't always feel like I'm old, uh, but I'm not as young as I used to be, and I feel like I need more rest than I used to get. And uh, it's an interesting fact that the body, if we lived to be 80 years old, we would have spent a third of our life asleep. That means 27 years we spent sleeping. Uh, so the body needs rest, and, and the spirit also needs rest. And we know that God has provided a rest for our spirit or our souls. And that's found in Christ and Christ alone. Uh, many people seek it, seek that rest in a lot of different ways. But taking a position that, that we have to measure up to God, that we have to be good enough in order to become born again. 
and that we have to uh, do a tremendous amount of good works and persevere in those works. Uh, that's in order to get to glory. That's a burden that God does not desire for any of us to carry. Uh, he's given us rest. You see, if we could have measured up, there would been no need for Christ to have come. But the fact of the matter is that we we do not measure up and we cannot measure up. And that's what that's what the law shows us. The law is like a measuring stick, and when we see uh, that we fail, and that we're unable to keep the law, we see that we don't measure up. So we find that there there is one that does and uh, did and does measure up, and that's the Lord Himself. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the number of people that are carrying that burden of trying to be good enough so that they can merit heaven and immortal glory. Um, The good news is that salvation is by grace and by grace alone. And that Jesus finished the work and and that He tells us in the book of Hebrews that He has ceased from His work. Six days the Lord created Uh, the heaven and the earth and everything in there and man and on the seventh day that God rested and it talks about that we need to labor to enter into that rest. And Now that almost seems like a contradiction in terms to labor to enter into rest but that labor is to uh, keep our eyes fixed upon the Lord to trust in His merit and His sacrifice cast off our works as as the basis for entering glory and rest in what Jesus has done because He did a perfect work in every regard. And when we labor to do that, to trust fully in the Lord and throwing off the works of the flesh, we can truly find rest. He said there remaineth a rest for the people of God. And I, I think if I'm not deceived in my heart, that we found that rest. Now, I know that many, as I say, many of God's people and um, that are walking in other paths and uh, trying to measure up, they need their blessings as well. But that's just a burden that we can't carry. And the Lord talks about being yoked. Who or what are we yoked to? Now, if you know what a yoke is, if you know anything about oxen, then the oxen would plow a field and you would have two oxen and they would be yoked together. It was a, it was a special device that tied the two oxen together so they could walk in lockstep to pull the plow. And the Lord tells us that we're to be yoked unto Him. Uh, he does also tell us that you're not to yoke an ox and an ass together. Okay? (laughs) But anyway, and we're not to be, uh, in our relationships, we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, That is another subject in itself. But if we're yoked to the Lord, we're walking in lockstep with Him. And if we're uh, not yoked to the Lord, we indeed should be. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, he says, "Come unto me, all that all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." God's people that are trying to measure up need to come to the Lord. Need to need to come to terms with the Lord. Need to come to where He is, to the foot of the cross, and lay all that you have at His feet. Uh, I don't know how to emphasize properly the the fact that uh, good works have no place in eternal salvation and evil works have no bearing on eternal salvation for the for the elect. When he says, "And the children be not yet born, 
neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So God does not choose us based upon good works, neither does he reject us on the basis of evil works. That purpose was purp- uh, the purpose of God electing his people is purposed in himself. So your works, whether good or evil, have no bearing whatsoever on eternal salvation. However, they have, they have a lot to do through the grace of God with walking in obedience in the here and now and walking in a way to please the Lord. We absolutely need to seek out good works. We need to walk in love and be obedient to the commands and the precepts of God. But as far as eternal glory, we need to come to the Lord. And he says, come unto me all you that labor. And I can imagine that he's speaking to uh, the Jews who were were thinking that all the good works would give them favor with God as far as getting them into glory. And I'm reminded of the prayer of uh, of the Pharisee and the publican. And the Pharisee boasted of all his good works. And he even said, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this man, like this publican. So he prayed thus with himself. And I don't think that that prayer was heard. But there is no boasting. Boasting is excluded by the law of faith. There's, we cannot boast in the sight of God. Uh, it's rejected. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and when he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If eternal salvation could be gained by us keeping a law, keeping a command or a precept or measuring up, then that would give us place to boast. But there is no place to boast before God because Jesus Christ did it all. He came to save His people from their sins and He did it. He didn't try to save His people. He saved His people. So, but He says, You come unto Me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I remember at one time that I was laboring and heavy laden with how can I continue to keep up the, the pace of you know giving enough money to the church and being at church and and doing all the good works that that the scripture speaks about so I can you know just hold on long enough to get to heaven and that's a heavy burden to carry but when you find when you come to the reality to see that the blood of Christ was the perfect sacrifice, that cleanse for he says he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And if he's obtained eternal redemption for us, there's nothing that we can do to add to that. Not accepting Christ or anything. What we know that accepting Christ is something that we all need to do. But we don't do it and so that we can become children. We do it because we are children. Just as we expect our children to be obedient unto us, God expects His children to be obedient unto Him. And just as we expect our children to accept the rules of our house, have you said this recently? This is my house and you'll live by my rules. Well, that's what the Lord expects for us. We're in His house and we live by His rules. And... uh, and we need to give him the respect that we that we as parents would expect from our own children to accept our person and the rules that we set for our home. It's the same thing. We need to accept the person of Christ and we need to live by his rules. Not not in order to become children, so that we might please him, so that we might do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So the invitation is to come unto me. Come to Jesus, the author 
and the finisher, finisher of your faith. He authored your faith. He will complete it. And he says, and the Apostle Paul says, being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun a good work in you shall continue it unto the day of Christ Jesus. You are the potter. God is the potter. You are the clay. He's molding you and making you what He wants you to be. And it's, it's not up for me to try to mold and make my wife. Or it's not her job to try to mold and make me. Every time that, that we try that, it's a problem. <laughs> there's, a, there's friction and there's heat. <laughs> and maybe some words said. So I learned a long time ago to thank God for my wife, for who she is. And, and if there's any changes that needs to be done, I'm going to get out of the way and let God do it. It's not, it's not, and who I would want her to be is not who she needs to be. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, God's the potter, we're the clay, and we are His workmanship. So I'm going to let God do any changing that needs to be done to me, my wife, and pray that I have grace to recognize when God calls me to repent or to make a change in my life or to step out in faith to do something that He would have me to do. I need to be um, ready to listen to that still, small voice and be obedient to what God would uh, have me to do. And it's no different with each of you. You need also to be uh, listening. But many times we allow the things of the world to drown out the things of God. Uh, like in the parable of the sower, when he says, the sower went forth to sow seed. And the seed was the Word of God. And some seed fell among the thorns, and it was choked. And, they, and he explains that saying that uh, the, the cares of this life and the riches and, and the things that people chase after choke the Word and it became unfruitful. Well, I'm going to tell you that you can't become unfruitful unless you are fruitful. I don't think every one of those, uh, the seed that fell by the wayside, the seed that fell on the stony ground, the seed that fell on the thorns, among the thorns, and the seed that fell into good ground, every one of those, it says, they received the Word of God. Now, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. And this book is of the Spirit of God. So, I'm, I'm of the mind to believe that every one of those were children of God. Uh, it, yet, they, they just allowed, they may have been at different stages of growth. Uh, not everyone, just because someone is... Uh, 80, 90 years old or 10 years old. Uh, being 10 years old doesn't make you necessarily a babe. Being 80, 90 years old doesn't make you fully mature. Some, uh, some people uh, I've seen before that have been in the house of God all their life and they never learn anything. They never grow. But he says as newborn babes that we're desi to desire the sincere milk of the Word that we might grow. Um, that's like a newborn baby doesn't have any teeth. You don't try to uh, give steak to a baby. You know, he says strong meat belongs to them that are full of age. Uh, you give meat to someone that has teeth so they can chew it. Uh, and there's a, there's a time when a, a person becomes mature, they don't need milk anymore. They're weaned as the Scripture talks about being weaned from the breast. Uh, I, there's a Scripture, and I, 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 I don't really know uh, exactly where it's located. But I think maybe it's Solomon. It talks about our little, our little sister that has no breast. And I, I think that this is probably talking about um, the doctrine of uh, of milk and toast. In other words, uh, God gives women breasts so that they can feed their babies. And 
they're called breasts of consolation. And I'm trying to be sensitive about this because I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying. But there are some, some orders where the people are not being fed milk because there are no breasts. And, and, this, and I think it's Solomon that talks about what, what will we do for our little sister that has no breast. Uh, many of God's people are starving to death. Uh, they, they have no spiritual sustenance. You see, the nature of God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And we can have that spiritual sustenance because the Lord provides. The Lord provides for us. Uh, Anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, but the Lord says, gives an invitation to come unto me. No one else. There's, there's no one else besides Him. There's no other name given among, uh, among men whereby we must be saved. But that's the name of Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Cast off all your works. Cast off all the things that you think that you have to do in order to gain eternal life. And now, you can, if you do that, you can find rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, uh, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, He can give us rest because He's finished the work that God gave Him to do. He knows that there's nothing more left to be done. He offered Himself through the eternal Spirit unto God. And you know, brothers and sisters, that blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross is never offered to you and I. It's never offered to you and I to accept or reject. That blood was offered unto God. It was God's uh, justice that was violated. It was God's holy laws that were violated when man sinned in the garden and when we sinned. It was His justice that needs to be appeased. And the blood of Christ was offered through the eternal Spirit unto God and God accepted that sacrifice and has declared that it's uh, once and for all that sin is put away as far as the east is from the west. But the Lord says, Come unto Me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You see, a lot of times we want to be yoked with the world. We want to yoke ourselves to the world. We want to, you know, we want to do what the the majority does. We want to do what the crowds are doing. Uh, I remember my mother used to say all the time that if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you do it? Did you ever hear that? I know y'all probably had something that you know. My mother used to. Uh, said that I had rusty ears. I don't know how long it's been since uh, when I was young. She said when she would bathe me, oh, I need to clean behind those rusty ears. They, but our parents always had these sayings. Uh, but if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you do it? And I think she was trying to teach me not to follow the majority. And we shouldn't follow the majority, but we shouldn't be yoked. We shouldn't be yoked to the world. We need to be yoked with the Lord. We need to be pressing toward that the mark of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus. And the Scripture says in one place, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You ever seen anybody that uh, at a picnic and they had the three-legged race? Uh, that, where the, I guess they tie their legs to uh, two legs together and then you have to run... You know how awkward that is and how many people fall? Now, there's a couple of people that there are, there are children that may be able to get it and get really good at it. But you see, we need to be yoked with the Lord and walking in lockstep with Him. And, it's, and I believe that it's a tender walk. Uh, but He says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, I, I imagine that those children that were, were uh, uh, that won the three-legged race, they, they stopped and they talked to each other. Now they'll say, now we'll start off with the legs that's tied together. And then we're going to take not really long strides, but we're going to take short, uh, mid strides. And they'll, they'll communicate and they'll talk with one another. And that's the same thing that we need to do. If we're yoked with the Lord, let's talk to Him. And if we're not, if we're not talking to Him and we're not communicating, 
How can we expect that we can walk and walk step with Him? But we need to be in agreement. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, and that's, uh, that's true with our relationship with God. That's true in our relationship uh, with husband and wife. That's true in, in a lot of different aspects of life. But how can we walk together except we be agreed? I, I agree or I believe with the, the Word of God. Even though I, I feel like at times I understand very little. But nonetheless, I agree with it that it's the truth uh, and, and that, it's, uh, that, it's, that it's God's Word or God's will revealed to man. So I, how can we walk with the Lord unless we agree with Him, unless we agree with, his, with, with what He says? And, and in this case, I'm going to yield and I, I need to do more listening than to try to tell the Lord how we need to walk. I'm going to let Him tell me how we need to walk. Because he knows, he sees the end from the beginning. Uh, uh, now, if, if you were having a three-legged race and you knew somebody that uh, that had the power to project the outcome, uh, you might want to choose that person at the picnic, right? But we we come to the Lord because we know that He's God. I mean, he's, he knows what's going to happen ten seconds from now, ten minutes, ten hours, ten days, ten weeks, ten years. Uh, he knows. He sees the end from the beginning. The, the Lord doesn't learn anything. So, what? Uh, who else would we go to? Who else would we go to but to the Lord? So we we come to Him and we're yoked together with Him, and uh, we should be listening to, so He can tell us how we're going to take the next step. And there's a lot of times that we come to crossroads in this life, are there not, or forks in this life. And we have to make decisions. Sometimes it may be a fork like that. Well, there's only there's two different paths you have to choose from. Sometimes there may be three paths, or four, or maybe even five. Uh, now, if I'm going to stop, if I've got a decision to make, I need to ask the Lord about it. Because knowing me, I'm going to take the wrong path. If, it, if, I, if I don't consult the Lord, if I don't pray to the Lord, I'm going to wind up taking the wrong path. Uh, but you know that some, uh, even sometimes when we do, when we may get, get in a ditch or in that valley, the Lord's there to lift us up and to pick us up and set us right back on the right path. But, he's, but He says, You come unto Me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take My yoke upon you, and learn of me. You see, we need to learn more about the Lord. There's a song in our songbook that says more about Jesus. And we do need to learn more. We can't learn too much about, about the Lord. But we need to learn of Him. Uh, not only are we taught of Him, John 6.45 says, and they shall all be taught of God. But we need to learn more about uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, about God who... Uh, took upon Himself a body in the likeness of sinful flesh and came and suffered and bled and died for us. And, and we need to learn more about His love and His mercy and His grace and His goodness and compassion, forgiveness and kindness and uh, all the great benefits that He loves us with daily. We need to learn more about Him. Uh, I'm impressed by my grandson. I can probably tell you... Uh, who quarterbacks every team in the National Football League can probably give you his stats and tell you about the running backs and the wide receivers and the defensive ends and safeties and uh, knows more about football than I've ever known. Um, yet I, w I would be more encouraged if I knew that he was putting that much energy and, and brain power into learning about the Lord. But... We can't learn about the Lord unless we come to Him. And the good news is that we can have a sit down and we can talk. And a, a lot of times, you know, the way that it is, we, we come to the Lord in prayer and we've got this laundry list of everything that we want. But have we ever just stopped to say, Lord... 
How's your day going? What have you got planned today? Is there something that I can do to help? You know, but our nature, it's, it's like, it's almost like that fair-weathered friend. We only come, you ever have that friend that only comes around when they want something? Then after, they, after you give them what they want, you don't see them. They don't come around anymore. We shouldn't be like that. We should be at the ready to sit down and, and talk with the Lord and to pray and commune with Him, share our heart, and, and praise and Take the time to praise Him. and Because uh, He's worthy. Nobody else is, but the Lord's worthy. I feel guilty sometimes because I, I just go to the Lord and it's always like, okay, Lord, here, here's everything that I, I want or everything that I need. And uh, He desires our fellowship. And we can go to the Lord and we can learn of Him in song. A lot of these songs that we have in these books, I tell you what, you get down and, and you become discouraged Open up that songbook. I mean, sometimes you don't even have to open it up. That song's in your heart. Just start belting it out. Brother Lord, you belt them out anytime you feel like it. You just let it, let it rip. Because God desires to hear your voice. He desires to hear it. Come to Him. Let's have fellowship. And it's not always about asking for something. I know that when our children were young, it seems like that it was all, you would go into the store and they were always asking for something. They're a little older now, and uh, now we can sit down and we can talk. They're 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 more mature. They want to nurture the relationship, and it's not about asking mom and dad for something. It's about sharing their hearts and sharing their ups and downs and sharing their their blessings and thanking us for what we did, what we've done for them or are doing. But he says, "You come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of the Lord. You can't. In order to do that, you've got to get close. You've got to draw nigh." But you learn of the Lord. He says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And he says, And you shall find rest unto your souls. Rest unto your souls. Now that's that's priceless. By the way, <laughs> this is out in right field, I guess, or left field. How many souls were on the ark? Eight souls. I, I don't want to get into this business about animals and going into heaven. But the Scripture very plainly says there were eight souls on the ark. Okay. For whoever, if that helps anybody, take it for what it's worth. But we'll find rest for our souls by coming close to the Lord, yoking with Him, walking in walk step with Him. He says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You want an easy yoke and a light burden? This is the only way you're going to find it is coming to the Lord and learning of Him. And He'll give us, He'll give us that which we stand in need of. We have that promise. But He has to come first in our lives. If He doesn't come first, you're wrong. And you're dreadfully wrong if you don't put the Lord first. The Lord comes ahead of your wife, your husband, your children, your job, everything. The Lord comes first. He's, I am a jealous God. God is jealous. Anyone or anything you put ahead of the Lord, you might want to prepare yourself to lose it. Because he can, I've seen it happen. He can take it away. 
in an instant. But we put God first, we keep Him first. We love, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, all our strength, all our mind, all of our faculties, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Come unto the Lord, cast off your works, understand that He finished the work of eternal salvation, you're saved by His grace, and the only place that your works have anything to do with is whether or not we please the Lord and walk in obedience in this lifetime. They have nothing to do with getting you into heaven. Absolutely nothing. Just as you had nothing to do with being born into those bodies that you're in, you had nothing to do with being born again of the Spirit of God. You were passive. And God, you were dead in trespasses and sins, and God spoke life, and you lived. And here you are today desiring to seek after the things of God. It's an evidence of your gracious state that you that you've been born of the Spirit of God, and now because you're children, God wants you to be obedient. That's simple. It doesn't get any simpler than that. And that's what the majority of this book addresses, is how can we walk in a way to please the Lord? How can God's people walk in a way to please the Lord? This book is not written to the dead. And God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. So, draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto you. Come unto the Lord. Cast off your works. Take His yoke upon you. Learn of Him. Find rest for yourselves. I thank you all for your good attention. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.